I welcome you to take your Bible with me. And we're going to start in Proverbs 31, right near the end of the book of Proverbs. We're seven weeks into our series, Embrace Potent and Practical Wisdom. And I encourage you to have your Bible, have a message outline. We're sending the outline out via email. It's on our webpage. Uh, it's on the YouTube link there also. And uh, have those resources available so you can study God's Word with me. Last time, we talked about some of those purity principles and our problem with availability and acceptance and corrupted appetites. And we need to establish a new authority in our life where we choose to follow biblical instructions, how we, and then choose to follow good body stewardship, thinking about compromising situations and new and improved appetites, not just taking away the negative, but adding some positive. And then those accountable relationships, some of those things when it comes to purity are just so overwhelming that we really can't go it alone. And so this week, again, we're looking over and over at different topics from Proverbs, but also from other parts of the Bible. And this is one of those, again, where we're looking at Proverbs, but we'll collect truth from other parts of Scripture. And this is about work. And work's kind of often we think of it as kind of a, well, it's work, right? It doesn't sound good. And I like what I found a little... Uh, goofy story. Whose job is it? And it says this. This is a story about four people, everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. And there was an important job to be done, and everybody thought somebody would do it. And anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. And somebody got angry about this because it was everybody's job, and everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Whew, it's kind of confusing. But sometimes it captures our challenges when it comes to work. And work is, you know, a word that we don't like. And sometimes we have a skewed view of work. So we want to capture some work wit from Proverbs, from other parts of the Bible. Consider some work wasters and then collect some work wisdom like we're doing in these other areas. So first, some work wasters. And these might be ones that come to your head, and you might be thinking of some others as well. But one is pleasure um, on your outlines there. Pleasure. Uh, why work when we can enjoy? You know, I'd rather just hang out and have a good time than work. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that, we might say. And, and there's so many things, there's so many ways to pass the time apart from meaningful work. And, you know, there's TV, there's, there's Netflix, there's uh, kind of scrolling through social media, there's video games. They're surfing the web aimlessly, uh, celebrity gossip sites, uh, constant Facebook checks, and the list just goes on and on. There's other things we could be doing to kind of satisfy the pleasure of the moment. There's also sometimes when we think about consider the work wasters or things that slow us down with work, our provision. And in our culture, we have good programs to help those in need, but they some, can sometimes be abused by those who are work wasters. And I know over the years, often we get calls here at the church for assistance. And sometimes in, in, as part of those calls, we'll check with other churches to see how things are going with this individual and see who's providing resources. And, and often we're able to help people in wonderful ways, but sometimes the stories don't quite match up. And some people are looking for provision without accountability, without work, without responsibility. And so that's, that's a problem. Another one uh, is, like, for example, during the pandemic, and I've read numerous news articles about this, the helpful provision of job loss income for many, you know, an increasing unemployment benefits that meet very real needs, but sometimes it causes some to think in their heads, well, wow, why work when I make more not working? And so we have these problems sometimes with provision and how that works, and, and, and it, we can kind of get it messed up. When we think about work wasters, not just pleasure and provision, but sometimes pride. And we have this concept, well, we all deserve meaningful work, and, and, and that's a nice concept. But sometimes we have this idea there are classes or levels of work. And sometimes we have this idea of work that is below us. Well, there's only so much I'll do. I'm above that. Well, I've been there and done that. That work is beneath me. Right? So sometimes... Pride enters into what we're willing to do, what we're willing to work at. 
Also, there's this sense of pragmatism when it comes to work, maybe for those that are engaged in work life. Well, business is business. So long as I get ahead, anything goes. It's why it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, whatever works. Or maybe it's uh, as an employee, uh, I work for a big and personal company. What does it matter if I, I take a few liberties or slack a little there or take a little there, here? And as an employer, maybe high paying jobs are kind of scarce. So why treat my employees fairly? You know, I'll just uh, find another one if that doesn't work out. I'll take whatever I can get for as long as I can get it. So these key areas, and you might think of others, are some of the work wasters, some of the things that uh, change the value of work or, or uh, depart from a biblical view on what work is. And I put on your outlines, um, how am I idling in life mismanagement? mismanagement? How am I just kind of sitting in neutral and just kind of idling, not really going anywhere in life mismanagement? Because work isn't just about, you know, the nine to five job or eight to five job or the eight to six job, whatever it might be, or night shift or whatever. It's about our life management, what we're doing productively with our life for the glory of God. So how am I idling? Am I just in neutral? How am I idling in life mismanagement? So you might have thought of some others in there, but let's collect some work wisdom from Proverbs. We'll start in Proverbs 31. And we're going to jump all over the place. And we'll just collect some, some key principles in three areas and then wrap up. And, and uh, I encourage you, remember, when we hear these and we, we think about these, we got a choice to make like in these other areas. Am I going to listen to them? And I'm going to figure out how they work in my life. So let's collect some work, work wisdom. The first concept is we, we ought to do our fair share. That's certainly a biblical wisdom. If we're able, and everybody, and we understand that you know, everybody's at different stages of life, and, and sometimes in order to meet needs of people that are hurting or aren't able to work, we make some provision. But in general, if we're able-bodied, able to work, and we're in that situation in life where we can, we're called to do our fair share. So for example, in Proverbs 31, starting in verse 13, she selects wool and flax. And this is about our effort, I think, here, our work effort. We're called to work hard and, and do and put some effort into working. And, and we see this a beautiful image of this of this woman and, and what she's like. And she puts a lot of effort into, into her role. And it's not just about earning money. It's about working and being productive and having good stewardship. She's like the merchant ships, verse 14, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and, and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. So this person is certainly doing their, their fair share. They're expending a good amount of effort. You know, 2 Thessalonians over in the New Testament in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 17, or verse 7, excuse me, the Apostle Paul says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. Notice it's if, if he will not, if there's ability, availability, and, and, and there's resources so a person can work, there's this principle. It's like, hey, we, you know, if we want to eat, if we want to have provision, we ought to be involved in that. And we all understand that there's some that you know, society and culture and, and church families need to provide for those that can't meet their own needs. But in general, the principle is if a man can work, person can work, they ought to. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down, earn the bread they eat, and as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. So Old Testament and New Testament, you know, we're called to do our fair share in terms of our effort. But it's hard, and some of us struggle with this. I like what Thomas Edison said, Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> See, we were built for work, really, when you think about it, for meaningful existence through using our time, our talents, and our abilities wisely. I mean, what were Adam and Eve doing in the garden? You know, the Bible says they, they were working. In Genesis 2, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, 
and to take care of it. So there's this stewardship responsibility that takes effort. You know, someone once said a ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And we're built for quality stewardship of our time, talent, and resources. And God says, hey, I want you to do in keeping with your abilities, your state, your, your, your position in life, and how old you are, and what, what culture God's put you in, how he's gifted you, to do our fair share with our work effort. But also, we do our fair share in terms of our work ethic. Effort and now ethic, E-T-H-I-C. And that's in Proverbs 13, verse 11. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. We're not called to work hard at being dishonest in making dishonest money to support ourselves, right? We're called to be honest in that process. Proverbs 18, 9, one who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. And so when we think about it, you know, are we helping by my slackness at work? Am I helping destroy my own company that I might work for? Or are we helping our companies succeed through our hard work and effort, let's say, for example, in the business world? Proverbs 21, verse 25, the sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. Leviticus 19, verse 13, just that first part of it, we'll look at the second part a little later, don't defraud your neighbor or rob him. And, and, and we might say, well, I would, I would never rob my neighbor but in the business world, in the work world, are we stealing time and resources by our lack of a good work ethic, for example? And so we're called to do our fair share. That's part of biblical wisdom, and that's part of proverbial wisdom, in our effort and in our ethic. So Ephesians 4, verse 28, Paul says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. And he gives some examples. Doing something useful with his own hands that me, he may have something to share with those in need. And I like that. We not, we not only work to provide for ourselves, but we work in such a way that if God gifts us with that, we have excess to share with someone else. There's also this sense of a work environment. And this is very much where we live today. And, this, and, and I think the Bible breaks out when it comes to work environment in two key areas. One is on work-life balance, we'll get that in a second, but also a sense of fairness. And so whether you're an employee or an employer, there's a fairness that comes into play. So for example, in Leviticus 19, verse 13, at the end of that verse, it says, you know, at the beginning, don't defraud your neighbor or rob him. At the end, it says, don't hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. And that's this idea that, hey, if someone has earned and you're an employer and you've hired somebody or a contractor or somebody, you make sure you pay them in a timely manner. That's fair. That's part of a biblical work environment. Deuteronomy 24, verse 14, don't take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he's a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns, that means someone, a foreigner, Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he's poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you'll be guilty of sin. So there's this fairness that comes into work relationships and employer relationships and hiring somebody and not taking advantage of somebody because they're poor. So I can, I can get by with paying just a little tiny bit or I can, what are they going to do to me? They don't have a whole lot of power. So there's this fairness that comes in. Very practically, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, uh, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Wow, if an ox is working hard, it needs food. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, it's so important that Paul mentions that ancient writing in Deuteronomy. He says, for it is written in the law of Moses, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. And again, in 1 Timothy 5, 18, for scripture says, don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. The worker deserves his wages. So part of doing our fair share is creating a fair work environment, a fair work environment. But also environments, not just about fairness, it's also about this rest and work balance. You know, the work and play balance that sometimes we we talk about. We got to figure this out. Is life all about work, 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 work? Uh, probably not. Is life all about pleasure, 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 pleasure? Uh, play, 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 play? Of course not. And let me, let me read a little spoof on um, 
the the Lord is my shepherd uh, from the Bible. This is a spoof. It's not from the Bible, but it kind of captures sometimes our problem with work life, uh, work and rest balance. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done. For my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. Surely fatigue and time pressures shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. Now that's kind of silly but it captures this work environment of this balance between hard work and a time for rest and worship. So in Exodus 20, in verse 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this Sabbath expression from the law under Moses captures this sense of there's there's this cycle where we work hard, but also God says, I want you to rest and I want you to worship. And there's this cycle that needs to be in place. So over in Exodus 23, six days do your work, but on the seventh day don't work so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the slave born in your household and the alien as well may be refreshed. Six days, Exodus 34, it's over and over again here. Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. But for some of us, we mess up on work not by being too lazy, but by just going and going and going and going, and we mess it up. And I like what someone said, the trouble with success is that the formula is the same as the one for a nervous breakdown. (laughs) So we need to be careful in terms of work environment, not just about fairness, but also about this rest and work and worship balance. So we're called to do our fair share, and what, what does that look like? We looked at a couple of things. Another key principle when it comes to work wisdom is remembering, the, we're called to remember the consequences. And these, these are, these are kind of negative, right? And this first one is, is, is real negative. There's this sense of reduction, that if we're not careful about working to provide for ourselves or for those we need, we might end up with less. And we, under, we all understand that there's calamities and there's life circumstances that make some unable to support themselves. And we get that. We make provisions for that in the church and in our society. But in general, if we're able, and the opportunities there, we're called to work hard to provide. And when we don't do that, you know, bad things tend to happen. And one is reduction. So Proverbs 6, verse 9, How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. And we we looked at this when we talked about money and financial freedom and so forth, but this sense of reduction when we we gotta remember the consequences if we choose to be lazy. Proverbs 19, 15, laziness brings on deep sleep and the shiftless man goes hungry. Proverbs 24, verse 30, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment, Uh, thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. Not taking care of what we have and using what God has provided to meet our needs. Ecclesiastes 10.18, if a man is lazy, the rafters sag, if his hands are idle, the house leaks. So we got to remember the consequences. If we choose to not engage in meaningful work as God provides opportunity, Sometimes that leads to reduction. We don't have enough to meet our needs. Sometimes we don't have enough to meet needs because of uh, a pandemic or uh, our, our, our things in terms of our health or our age, a variety of different things. But often the Bible's teaching here that sometimes our reduction is because we're choosing to not work hard. There's also this sense of ridicule. 
And this is a hard one for us, I think, to, to grasp. One of the consequences of, of not using uh, uh, our work life as, as a stewardship and working the best we can is that we face a certain amount of ridicule when we do that. And so Proverbs 10, verse 5, He who gathers crops in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. Proverbs 10, 26, As is vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a slugger to those who send him. And you've got vinegar and it kind of hurts, right? And smoke in the eyes, it's kind of annoying. That's what it's like to deal with someone that's just lazy. Proverbs 12, 9. Better to be a nobody and you have a servant than pretend to be somebody and have no food. And there's this ridicule sometimes associated with choosing to be lazy. Proverbs 22, verse 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. Or, I will be murdered in the streets. It, it, what that means is, looking for every reason to not do something, even if they're unreasonable. Well, I, I, I can't do that. I might get eaten by a lion. Or I can't do that. I might get murdered in the streets. And, and, and that faces a certain amount of ridicule from people. It's like, really? Are you grasping for ways to not have good work stewardship? And people say all kinds of awful things about people that tend to be lazy. And, you know, he does an honest day's work. Of course, it usually takes him a week to do it. Or he's so, he's so lazy, they named uh, a pair of shoes after him, the loafer. He's so lazy, if he woke up with nothing to do today, he'd go to bed with it only half done. See, there's this ridicule that's associated with choosing to not be a hard worker. So we got to remember the consequences. That's part of work wisdom. Doing our fair share, remember the consequences. But also another one is enjoying the benefits. It's not all negative. There's some, there's some good things. And one is reward. You know, back in that Proverbs 6 section about the ant, and we saw it with money as well. Proverbs 6, verse 6, Go to the ant, you slugger. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no, no, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. There's reward to working hard and, and, and saving a bit and protecting and then having things available when there is need. There's reward to that. There's a benefit to that. And there's a reward, and sometimes there's a reward to doing good work, right, that leads to very good outcomes. I came across a fairly sensational story about this principle of good work. I want to share it with you that it has, it's very rewarding. And this is way back from World War II. And the USS Astoria was, uh, was a cruiser, and it was engaged in a battle, the, the Battle of Savo Island, back in August of 1942, and that's quite a long time ago. And, and this cruiser scored a couple hits on an Imperial flagship, but the Astoria was, was damaged, and it, sh it sank at just about noon or so on August 9th in 1942. About 2 a.m. in the morning, there was a young Midwesterner, uh, third-class petty officer, Staples. He was swept overboard on that ship by the blast uh, when one of the gun turrets exploded. And he was wounded in both legs by shrapnel, and he was in semi-shock. And the only thing that kept him afloat was this narrow life belt that he managed to activate when he was thrown into the water. And there was kind of a simple little trigger mechanism, and, and it saved his life. And he was in the water for several hours, and eventually he was rescued by a passing destroyer. He was returned to the Astoria, and this captain of the Astoria was attempting to save the cruiser by beaching her, but that didn't work out. The effort failed, and like I said before, the cruiser ended up sinking. And so Staples, Petty Officer Staples, ended back up in the water with that same life belt, and, and they finally got picked up again by the USS Jackson, and he was one of the 500 survivors of the battle, and they were evacuated. And he examined this life belt that had served him so well, and he noticed that it was made by the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company out of Akron, Ohio. So remember that name, Firestone. And it bore a registration number on this life belt that saved him from drowning twice. Now let me share a couple words with you from Petty Officer Third Class Staples. This is what he says. He says, After a quietly emotional welcome, I sat with my mother in our kitchen telling her about my recent ordeal and hearing what had happened at home since I'd gone away. And my mother informed me that to do her part, she had gotten a wartime job at the Firestone plant. 
And surprised, I jumped up and I, I grabbed my, my life belt from my duffel bag and I put it on the table in front of her. I said, Mom, take a look at that. It was made right here in Akron at your plant. And she leaned forward, he, he says, and taking the rubber belt in her hand, she read the label. She had just heard the story and knew that in the darkness of that terrible night, it was this one piece of rubber that had saved my life. And when she looked at me, her mouth and her eyes were open wide with surprise. And she said, son, I'm an inspector at Firestone. This is my inspector number. Well, we stared at each other, he says, too stunned to speak. Then I stood up and I walked around the table and I pulled her up from her chair. And we held each other in a tight embrace, saying nothing. And he, and he writes, my mom wasn't a demonstrative woman, but the significance of this amazing coincidence overcame her usual reserve. And we hugged each other for a long, long time, feeling the bond between us. My mother had put her arms halfway around the world to save me. See, folks, that's a dramatic story, but that's what I call a work reward. You know, and God says, hey, I want you to enjoy the benefits. There are benefits to working hard in meaningful tasks. There are benefits to working hard. That's, and that's, that, that, that's a dramatic example, isn't it? There's also a benefit of relationship on your outlines there, relationship. And there's this sense of appreciation that happens when none is, one is known for good life stewardship and how they work and how they manage their time and how they serve others. So when we started in Proverbs 31, for example, and that real godly woman that's mentioned there, she watches over the affairs of her house, uh, over, of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. And, and we talked in the, a few weeks back that, hey, if someone is praiseworthy, we ought to be sharing that. And, and, and most moms out there or people, help, uh, ladies managing a house, you say, hey, that's what I want my family to do for once, that they rise up and call me blessed. But there's this relational aspect that when we work hard, that tends to produce an appreciation in the lives of those around us that they're appreciative for our hard work and care. Karen, one of my, my wife is one of her love languages is certainly work and acts of service. And she likes to express her love for people through acts of service. And as family members, we all appreciate that. And you've probably noticed that in a church family and you appreciate it as well. There's also, when we think of relationship as a benefit uh, of, of our work ethic and our, our work stewardship, it's also about sharing. There's something wonderful that happens when we work hard. We saw it already in Ephesians 4. He who steals must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that me, he may have something to share with those in need. There's something wonderful when God allows us, when God equips us, when God provides the right set of circumstances, and we choose to engage in good work stewardship that we earn. And then we not only have enough to meet our own needs, but then we're able to share with others. And what a joy that is. It's a blessing for the one that gives. It's blessing also for the one who receives. And that leads to this relational aspect of generosity. The apostle uh, Luke writes in Acts 20, in everything I did, I, show you that, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when we are known for our hard work, there's this reward that comes when we are able to be generous. We share, and then we are able to express generosity into the life of others. So one of the benefits of hard work is this reward that comes and, and relationship that comes as a result of connecting with people through generosity and connecting with people through serving them in very meaningful ways. Um, another benefit is not just reward and relationship, but it's also reputation. Reputation by reputation. And we want, as a follower of Jesus Christ, how people view us matters. And we want to be known as people that are productive and have good life stewardship. So again, in Proverbs 31, verse 29, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she's earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. See, she has a good reputation because she is working hard and in meaningful ways to help those around her. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11, Make it your ambition to lead a 
quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And so there's this respect aspect, there's this re reputation aspect. Instead of being known for laziness, we can be known for good life and work stewardship. So we put this together, you know, we collect this work wisdom, do our fair share. It involves effort and ethic and, and a work environment. We remember the consequences. That's, that's about a reduction and ridicule. Those are hard ones, but also the benefits, reward, relationship, and reputation. So we put this all together. How will I engage? Not idling. Remember we asked at the beginning, am I idling in life mismanagement? But now, how will I engage responsible stewardship and service? Given my age and given my situation in life and the opportunities God provides me and, and how my body's doing, how will I engage? Shifting out of neutral into first, you know, it might be low. And for some of us, we might be able to shift through all the gears and for others, it might just be kind of inching along. But how will I start engaging responsible stewardship? That's our life stewardship. That's our life work and service. See, it's not just support about taking care of ourselves, but it gives us increased ability to serve others. Martin Luther, the great reformer from hundreds of years ago, Lutheran Church, Martin Luther, that guy, famous Luther, he says this, the prince should ask. And he's contrasting the prince and then a tailor, right? Someone that makes clothes or someone that's in a high position of authority. He says, the prince should ask, Christ has served me and made everything to follow him. Therefore, I should also serve my neighbor, protect him in everything that belongs to him. That's why God has given me this office, and I have it that I might serve him. And that would be a good prince and ruler. When a prince sees his neighbor oppressed, he should think, that concerns me. I must protect and shield my neighbor. And Luther goes on, he says, the same is true for shoemaker, tailor, scribe, or reader. If he's a Christian tailor, he will say, I make these clothes because God has bidden me to do so, so that I can earn a living, so that I can help and serve my neighbor. When a Christian does not serve the other, God is not present. That is not Christian living. You see, folks, we don't have to end up in this idle, this neutral, this kind of staying and, get, and, do, and not moving anywhere in this life mismanagement. We can meaningfully engage in responsible life stewardship and service, not only taking care of ourselves, but serving into the, uh, the life of others and serving my neighbor through how I handle work. Let's pray. Father, guide us in this. It's complicated. Our work life is, is difficult. It's not just about earning money outside the house. It's about our work and, our, and how, how we're productive and, and what our meaning is in life and how we use our, our, our time and our talents in appropriate ways. And for many of us, we need to kind of up the game and, and, and move aside from some of these things that are just kind of time wasters and not really capturing this sense of stewardship from you. Uh, for some of us, it's too much. It's seven days and it goes on and on and on. And, and then we neglect other things. We neglect our worship. We neglect rest. For some of us, God, we need, to help, we need your help figuring out what is my life work and what will it look like? God, guide us. Guide us in discovering work wisdom and then putting it in place in our homes, in, in, in our businesses, in our, in our church life really guide us. And then may you give us this joy of seeing that reward, the blessing and, and reputation and increased ability to help other people and generosity and sharing. And we just, uh, and, and provision, God guide us in it. And may, we, may you share those benefits with us. Bottom line, God, we want to love you first and we want to serve others through how we handle our work. Guide us in Christ's name. Amen.